Welcome, my dear ones. This is Tracy Anderson Askew, your host for the Transform Your Birth podcast, changing your mind about birth one story at a time. Each week, we'll be exploring a birth story through the lens of what birth can teach us. I'll be digging deep into each story so you can learn what it is that can change the way a birth unfolds. We can't control birth, but we can influence it. So listen in to find out how. Enjoy. Ali goes through the different models of care available to women when they're having a baby. She highlights that many of the models are very fragmented and don't really cater to the experience of the family. She highlights how relationships matter and tends to set the birthing parent up to feel more positive about the process. She also pulls apart what it is you get when you experience the different models of care. The model of care you access plays a significant role in the outcome of how your baby enters the world. This is a topic that is not talked about enough. Well worth a listen, even if you have already chosen your model of care. You might be able to bring in other forms of support. Enjoy. Hello. Welcome, everybody. Good to see you again this this week. I've got a very special guest this week. We're going to go off script a little bit and move away from birth stories because I've invited the beautiful Dr. Alison Tate to come and talk to us today. I just want to give you a bit of an idea about the credibility of this woman. She's a woman I've always admired. She's a midwife with over 30 years of clinical practice. She has a passion for enhancing quality midwifery care initiatives. So she's really, really good on different models of care. She's worked in the public health system in South Australia, Queensland, New South Wales, and the ACT. As an endorsed midwife, she now works in a private midwifery practice with Care Midwifery, but she's also the director for um, a midwife director for a collaborative practice and lactation clinic called the Mother Hub in Queanbeyan. Ali continues to have an academic role and is currently working for Edith Cowan University, but over the past 25 years, she's worked at the University of Canberra, Western Sydney University and the University of Technology in Sydney. She's the current chair for the ACT branch and a National Director for the uh, Australian College of Midwifery Board. And Ali completed her PhD in 2019. Ali's PhD explored why continuity of midwifery care improves clinical outcomes for both mothers and babies. She found that the relationship developed between midwife and mother through the course of the woman's pregnancy care enabled them both to be less worried and have more hope for labour and birth in the postnatal period. Relationship-based care built on trust and respect matters to midwives and mothers. Thank you for coming. It's so good to have you. Mm -hmm. Ali, a lot of our listeners are pregnant or thinking about being pregnant. Um, When it comes to choosing the model of care that they choose for their pregnancy, the management of the birth and early parenting, what do you think is important for pregnant women to know when choosing a particular model? What are the things that really make a difference for that for women? So I think firstly, a woman needs to do a bit of um, sleuthing or exploring what's on offer in her local area. Mm -hmm. and then identifying a practitioner that fits her expectations of what she wants for the birth and that that, um, pregnancy care, which can be a little bit tricky because um, most women that have had a birth know what they want the second time around. Most women that are having the first baby, it's all an unknown and and, um, they're very unsure of what they need. I would think things to think about are, what are the type of birth you're wanting? So if you're wanting um, a birth where um, you're upright and active and um, able to be able to be informed in an equitable process, so what I mean by that is that you can have a conversation with the care providers and they provide you with a list of options and their advice and then you can make that decision, then the, the public health service might be the place for you so when I talk about public, I mean the big, the bigger hospitals in your area where the midwives and doctors are employed. So those hospitals um, are governed by policies and protocols, and those policies and protocols should be informed by the best evidence. Sometimes that's a bit tricky because we know that policies often um, suit the care provider, not the care recipient. 
Um, but that would be a place where there's birth centres, um, where birth centre is focused on women being upright and active in labour. Um, compared to a birth suite, a labour ward or a delivery suite, where often those places are about the interventions that we do. So epidurals, um, induction of labour, um, continuous monitoring of the baby's heart rate, um, all things that on their own um, have some improvement for women in regards to um, pain relief, um, seeing the baby's heart rate throughout the birth. But those options don't actually improve the satisfaction for women and they don't improve the outcome for the baby. Things that matter are having a midwife that you know with you in that labour space, and that's where continuity of midwifery care is so influential. It's improved women's outcomes with satisfaction. They have a less, less reliance on epidural anaesthesia. They, um, funnily enough, um, have improved outcomes for their babies, so there's less chance of stillbirth and early um, miscarriage and stillbirth as well. Um, and there's no change in their risk factors in regards to that. So midwifery continuity care, which is beginning to be offered in many of the public hospitals around the country, is a place that I would start. If you're wanting to have a, a woman, mostly, some men working midwifery continuity care, but a, a partnership um, between that healthcare provider who will walk you through what your options are. If you choose a medical model, which might be your choice, you might think, oh, it's all too big a responsibility for me to make these decisions, so I'll just put the, my trust in my care provider, then that might be better with a, a private obstetrician because they're very skilled surgeons, so they often have a higher um, caesarean section rate because that's their place of safety for their perspective. So if you're planning a surgical birth or you're wanting not to have to be responsible for many of those decisions, then that might be the place to go. Mm. Most of those um, obstetricians work in private hospitals. Right. Mm. So what you're saying there is that it seems like there's two sort of versions. One is yep. more of a woman-centred, you have a relationship with your caregiver, you have, you know, exercise your um, choices, yep. asking questions, trying to sort of navigate the path in mm. collaboration with, and then in the obstetric model of care, you're more like you're handing over the the trust and the decision making more so to your obstetrician. Yeah, you're sort of um, having a reliance on their expertise, really. Mm. And what I mean by that is, if you are a person who goes to a health appointment and you're the recipient of the care from the healthcare provider. Yeah. So if that's an, an obstetrician, then they're going to provide you the advice based on what their skill set is. So their skill set often is surgery. Mm. They're not so com confident and comfortable about a vaginal birth. Um, they often aren't with women in labour. They'll pop in and out, but they rely on a midwife to provide that care. And if you're a midwife working in a private hospital, you have to abide by the obstetrician's um, expectations and standard operating procedures. So often that will be based on that surgery might be what the doctor thinks is the safest option. For some women, it's, we know that some women, a caesarean section is a very important aspect of their care and something that um, will benefit them and their baby. But if you're looking to try and have a vaginal birth, then I'd be recommending you either start with midwifery care where you can develop a relationship with that midwife through your pregnancy appointments and then have her or a small group of midwives caring for you or being available to care for you in labour. And if you were to go the next notch, you would have a private midwife, which gives you more flexibility. But most private midwives at the moment are restricted to caring for women in a home birth space. There's very few arrangements around the country for your private midwife to come into hospital with you for your labour. Right. So if you look at the spectrum then, you've got private midwifery, which is outside of mm -hmm. hospitals typically, although some private midwives can care for you. They do have visiting rights in hospitals. Correct. Is that right? Yep, some do. Uh, yes. So, so Queensland and New South Wales 
are probably the best states for that in right. regards to having your own midwife uh, that you employ privately who will come in to the hospital with you when you're in labour. Right, okay. And then you've got the public system which offers <clears throat> just general birth suite um, services so you'll get different midwives for your antenatal care during labour and birth and yes. postnatal. They tend to divide that into three areas. So you never yeah, so it's very, you can get on the day. It, it, it's very fragmented. Yeah. So those areas are staffed by uh, a, a group of midwives and doctors who are rostered over the 24-hour period. So right. you may not meet that doctor or midwife who's caring for you in the birth suite, the labour ward or the delivery suite, until you turn up in labour. Right, right. And you still have access to obstetric backup if you need that backup. So I think that sometimes people think, oh, they don't have access to obstetricians, but absolutely you do. But they're oh, absolutely. If, the you, if you, <clears throat> yes. So in the hospital, there's there's um, most of the hospitals around the country um, uh, are governed by a set of standards where they have to have, say, if they've got a birth suite there, um, they have to have an obstetrician, a paediatrician, and an anaesthetist available. Right. So if you're looking at a little hospital, that's often the expense of keeping those little hospital birthing facilities going is that you need um, a roster of obstetricians, a roster for anaesthetists and paediatricians. Right. let alone staffing it for wives who run the place as well. Yeah, okay. And then there's mm -hmm. the birth centre model where you get your own, um, the continuity models where you get your own midwife who follows you through the pregnancy during the birth and post yep. Yeah, and they're very yes. popular, those programs, because women love having that one point of connection where um, they develop a relationship, they get to know each other, the midwife gets to know what's important to her. And yeah. then so and then there's the obstetric model of care, which are typically private obstetricians who are often supported by midwives in their practice. So you tend to get more um, time with the midwife because the obstetricians themselves just do your very basic in and out checks, don't they? What what sort of time Correct. would they spend with an obstetrician during that yeah. um, pregnancy? And so, yeah, so if you look at an obstetrician's clinic and how they're set up, so the obstetrician will have probably anywhere between about a five and a 15-minute time allocation for their appointments with the women, and the midwife might meet the woman before and after that appointment, so they might do their blood pressure, test the urine, um, and then they might have a conversation with you after about things that you might need to be planning or expecting and giving you some information about what labour and birth are. Um, but often um, those conversations are governed by what the obstetrician wants the, the woman to know. So mm -hmm. it might be restricted in some ways, which could... And that happens in the in the public hospitals as well. You know, the midwives are often governed by policies and protocols about how much information they can give to people. Mm. So often the information, although it's supposed to be unbiased, will have a bias on the expectation of the hospital or the obstetrician. I, I don't know if that makes sense, but what it means is that as a health professional, I'm supposed to and expected to provide information that is unbiased. So if we look at an epidural, for example, as a topic um, then I should explain to women that, um, yes, it gives them excellent pain relief. It doesn't always work. So there's a small percentage of failure, and that's probably, you know, maybe five in 100 where you won't get complete pain relief. Um, but what it then does is means that you then have higher levels of intervention. So you need an intravenous strip. You need to have a continuous monitoring of the baby's heart rate. Um, you often will need a urinary catheter and you'll be on the bed and not being able to move. So um, somebody who is restricted in their information about that might say, yes, it's a great form of pain relief and we recommend it. And that will be it. It won't tell the woman about what is involved. Yeah. If you look at um, other examples of information like um, the B-strip, and this is something that women will find out as their pregnancy goes. Uh, 
that most hospitals around the country will be offering women women a, a low vaginal swab when they're 36 weeks pregnant. It's a very easy, um, convenient test to do. It's it's not complicated. And what it does is test for this bacteria called group B streptococcus. Um, and that test is a screening test. So it will identify if this woman has the bacteria in her body at that time. And so if she does, then the, the management is that that woman is then offered antibiotics and labour to decrease the chance of the bacteria that may or may not be in her body when she's in labour to being transferred to the baby. Um, but often midwives uh, just on that as a routine investigation um, um, without giving any sort of unbiased information about what if you don't do the test. Mm. So the standard processes and protocols often may be biased in themselves. Um, and so if you've got a model of care where that practitioner is outside of the standard model, um, such as a private midwife, then you would have an expectation that they would give you unbiased information. But by a midwife being outside of a hospital and planning, looking after women and for a home birth, they will carry their own biases with them as well. Mm. So it's always tricky. Everyone that you see as a care provider will have a bias. If that practitioner is, is skilled, they should be able to provide you information that allows you to make a decision for yourself. Mm. I think that's one of the biggest um, teachings I certainly give in my classes, Ali, about the the need to ask questions. It's yes. so very important to ask questions, to identify um, the difference, one, between a, a medical necessity and a choice, mm -hmm. and then to when you're making choices, to understand the full ramifications of those choices. So a lot of women come into this space, for example, and epidurals is a good one, an example of, you know, oh, have the epidural. People have told them have the epidural. And epidurals certainly can be amazing under certain circumstances, but there's a lot that comes with them. And they then can have residual effects on the second stage of labour when you're trying to, you know, um, push your baby out which yeah. might invite more of an assisted vaginal delivery and and then that's going to influence your recovery and then so so the the information isn't always complete and it and like you just said it, it contains certain biases around it so one of the things that becomes pretty apparent when you start to explore these options is that relationships count they make yes. a really big difference. And so cultivating the relationship with your care providers is very, very important. And I don't think it matters what model of care that you access, even in an obstetric model, it's very important that you feel like you can talk to your care provider and Absolutely. potentially potentially say no. That's that's one thing. No, I don't want to do that. Thank you. I'd like to try this alternative first. Regardless of what model that you have, this is your experience of having your baby. This is your time and stepping up to the plate and being a part of that decision-making process tends to lead to much greater satisfaction on the other side when you've got your baby because whatever unfolds on the day, you've been a part of that decision-making process. So I think that's that's really critical. Ali, in your PhD, you explored continuity models which in my experience, you know, working with thousands of women now, they, that really is a very popular model of care, whether it be at home or in the hospital, because of that relationship. What is it that changes through the process of creating a relationship with your caregiver? Okay, I think, so my PhD, so what I did was I, I videoed antenatal appointments. So I would be sitting there with a the camera. So to some extent, probably the, the midwife and woman weren't as natural as they would be, say, if I set up a video and wasn't in the room mm -hmm. or if I'd just taken notes and, and sat back. So to some extent, um, my findings are swayed by these people feeling like they're actors on a screen to a little bit. But what I found was that when, and so I did these videos in a late pregnancy appointment, so the women were 
typically between 36 and 38 weeks pregnant, so within that last month of their pregnancy. So if they'd had a continuity model, they would have got to know their midwife quite well from all their antenatal appointments that they'd had starting at around about 14 to 16 weeks of pregnancy. So I videoed midwives and women in the continuity program at that late pregnancy appointment, and then I videoed midwives and women in an antenatal clinic in two hospitals where it was part of the fragmented model where the midwives were employed to staff the antenatal clinic and just provide appointments for whoever was booked in on that day. So there was no emphasis on the midwife and a particular woman getting to know each other again. It was just about um, making sure that the woman was well and that you ticked off a, a, a number of um, information uh points in that in that appointment which the continuity midwife goes through by those guidelines as well but the overlay is that the midwife and woman know each other from appointment to appointment and what I found was that the conversations were different um, and the conversations when the midwife and woman knew each other they were more equitable so they were more like friends talking or people who knew and understood each other better than when they didn't. So when they didn't know each other, there was very much, you could see the authority figure of the, the midwife compared mm -hmm. to the woman who was the novice. Mm -hmm. The other thing that I noticed was that when they talked, when the midwife and woman knew each other in the continuity model, they relied on storytelling. So when I talk about storytelling, it's about um, telling stories to possibly tell your point of view or to confirm an agreement with what that other person has said. Right. And that storytelling allowed that relationship to, it was either a, reflect, a reflection of that relationship or it allowed that relationship to, to develop. Um, all the midwives and all the women in those um, anti, and antenatal appointments, whether they were continuity or fragmented, um, brought worry into the appointment. So for midwives, it was a worry about making sure that they'd done what the hospital expected of them, um, made sure that they the care they provided was quality care and made sure that the baby was growing and the mother was well. For the women, often that worry was about, um, is my baby okay? Am I okay? Am I going to be okay for birth? So the common um, paraphrases or comments I heard in those appointments was, um, making sure and doing the right thing. So both the women and the midwives said that. So that worry was um, defined by those two statements, which I commonly saw. But when there was continuity or a relationship there, the women and the midwives talked optimistically and positively about what was to come. Whereas in the fragmented model, often the conversation was just about the care or the the medical assist assessment that was happening on that day. There was no projected, okay, so you're well, um, it's looking like your birth is going to be in the next month. Um, have you thought about this? Um, I'm expected to be there. If I'm not, you've met Tracy, who's the other midwife, and she'll be there for your birth. So there was much more optimism and positive reinforcement of those next events in the childbirth process. So why do you think that wasn't there in the more fragmented model of care where you've got different midwives doing your care what why why aren't they as positive because the midwives are only focused on that that um event of care that they're doing with that woman on that day so they're just so trying to do a good job they're just trying to do a good job but they don't link that job to what's going to happen for that woman in the next stage of her childbirth which is mm -hmm. the labor and birth and then the postnatal so Maybe they're not familiar because they have worked in the clinic for years, so they're not familiar with the labour and birth environment. Um, and for most midwives who are employed in the hospital, their experience of the postnatal period often lasts around the first two weeks of the baby's life. And then the women are off out into the community accessing community care options, whether that's the GP, the child and family health, maternal and child health, or other private practitioners. So... Yes, they provide good care in that moment, but it's not linked to what that woman's experience is going to be as she goes through her childbirth and her early parenting. Mm. And I think that's, I think you've just nailed the difficulties of those both 
the obstetric model of care as well as the public model of care in that it is still fragmented that and and to that mother's journey it's all one big long journey and to yes. have some level of continuity and relationship with professionals who can help guide you deliver you non-biased information um, give you choice and help you to work towards what what's important to you as a woman birthing and also as a family as you welcome your baby that's that yeah. it's just so obvious isn't it when you you see that now not all women ally can access continuity with a known midwife so what other mm -hmm. options might they have in that case okay so things that you need to think about is what would give you strength and confidence mm -hmm. with moving forward yeah. so the, that might be a, an, somebody that you engage as a medical practitioner. Um, and what I mean by that, they might be um, your GP. It might be a, an obstetrician you engage with. It might be um, a, a midwife in, in private practice. Or if you're thinking that, okay, I've got those things set up, but I feel like I still need more, then you might look at having a doula. Mm. Other things that, and I'll talk about the role, the different role between a doula and a midwife in a minute. Um, but other things that you need to think about is what's the supports that you have in your community, in your family? So I think we often forget that there's lots of experienced people out there that have mm -hmm. done this for you. So um, hooking in with um, community groups, hooking in with family or friends who have had a baby and are going through that early parenting or it might be a grandparent or a, or your your parents um asking them looking for their support you know the birth of the baby is often a one day event you know it's mm. their birthday but being a parent it's a big journey you're that parent for that child's entirety of their life so um that is a big job often it's not valued in the contemporary way that we focus on childbirth care so whether that's obstetrics or midwifery whether it's private or public we're very focused on the birth of the baby your yeah. pregnancy but really you're on your own when you're a parent so you need to look at other avenues of support mm. um, and I think that's where Tracy comes in with her transform parenting um, but there's other opportunities about other models of um, advice and engendering support that are out there that you need to look for. Mm. If I ravel back to the midwife role and the doula role, the midwife is trained and skilled in providing um, advice in the antenatal period, um, information um, for um, your pregnancy, your pregnancy health and the health of your baby, and then providing um, assessment and um, monitoring of your labour and birth and in the postnatal period when you've got a newborn baby, those assessments and monitoring skills. Um, midwives, by and large, are caring, um, supportive people, but they may not be focused on your individual needs at every given moment. And what I mean that by that, say if you've been a midwife that's worked for 5, 10, 15, 20 years and you've been working in the same place or it might have been the same hospital in different places you've moved around, you're still very focused on your role. So you tick all your clinical skills off, but you see different women, you know, you might see six or seven women in one day. Being able to be in the moment all the time and to be concerned about that individual doesn't always bubble up as the most important factor. Yeah. So sometimes midwives and doctors will come across as aloof, busy, um, and not focused on you. And it's not that they go to work thinking that. It's just that the influence of repetitive care providing means that often they forget about the finer details of human connection. And so a doula could be the person that enables you to get that emotional um, and supportive care. Or it could be a person in your family that's had a baby who comes with you to give you that emotional and supportive care and ex mm -hmm. another experienced 
person in birth. It might be your sister, your mother, a friend, um, or somebody that's there to help your partner on the day as well. Yeah. As a doula myself, Ali, I um, <clears throat> when I was working as a doula, I'd often talk to the midwives and they'd say to me, you're doing what I thought I'd be doing as a midwife. Mm, they love yeah, yes. they, they really miss having that real interpersonal connection where all all I needed to do as a doula is to just be there for that couple I, w- I didn't have to do paperwork I didn't have to you know yeah. front up to the the head of the unit or anything like that I was just able to focus fully and completely on the yeah. couple and so the the doula system is a fabulous um fabulous option if you are not able to access continuity of care of a non-midwife but even I see women who do the continuity model and still have a doula it's still an option absolutely yeah Yeah. um I think the continuity (laughs) model in its basic uh delivery is Mm. based on the premise of a quality relationship yeah where the midwife and woman respect and know each other um It doesn't mean always in the public health system that you're going to have somebody that you connect with. They might do all the medical stuff, um, but you may not connect and feel completely at one or emotionally supported by them. Mm. In a perfect world, you'd have another midwife who would come in and do that for you, like you'd replace that continuity midwife. Um, We know the world's not perfect, and so that doula can be that option. Yeah. The tricky thing about doulas, and this is an important thing that I think is uh, people need to be aware of, is that doulas often will, will um, by the nation, the nature of their being focused on the, the woman and her family and her partner's needs, often will ask the pointy questions that the health professionals may not feel comfortable in answering, answering or may feel challenged by that. And so by the nature of the, the doula doing her job and um, advocating and supporting and caring for that woman, it might create some animosity in the room. Mm. So it's useful to have, I think, have conversations with the healthcare providers and the doula about what their expectations for each other are in that, particularly in that birth space. Mm. That's, a, that's a great point. It's very, very important Um, you get the roles very, very clear. A doula cannot give you medical advice and should not give you medical advice. And it's very important a doula in their role doesn't cross that that line. But as Ali said, they are the sort of people who do know the system a little bit better and who are prepared to ask those questions um, in order for you to get the information to make the decision. It's not the doula's decision and it's not her advice you're seeking. She can help you, though, understand the landscape and where the wriggle room might be. Is this really necessary? Could we wait a little bit? Could we try something else, these types of things? Mm. Yeah. Do you feel comfortable with this? Have you got any questions that you want to ask yeah. the midwife yeah. or the doctor? Exactly. Um, ask them, why are they recommending this? Mm. And often that recommendation will say, oh, well, that's just what we do here. Yeah. And then what would happen if we didn't do that? So I think it's, yeah, having those questions where um, it allows for the information to be provided to the woman that enables her and her partner to make that decision. Um, And probably just a proviso, um, I've used the term woman in my conversations, but as we know, there are people that don't identify as women when they're carrying babies. Um, So... Um, I generally use the term because most of the people who care for are women, but there are people that don't identify as women and I respect them. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's just easier in a conversation like this to talk about women and, and partners. Yeah. 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 Beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. So, Ali, <clears throat> in your sort of understanding, we've talked a lot about relationship today, the importance yeah. of being able to um, have a relationship have a conversation, be able to ask questions, Mm. be able to get on the same page, to be able to identify the difference between a medical necessity and a choice. Is there, what what sort of time do continuity midwives typically give a woman during an antenatal care compared to the other models? 
Okay. So that, that's a good question and it changes from place to place. And when I mean place to place, it's probably hospital to hospital and maybe state to state or state to territory. Right. So um, if you look at most antenatal appointments in the fragmented or the standard system, so there's not, there's not a continuity relationship there, um, it, those antenatal appointments after the first one, the first appointment often is about an hour or an hour and a half depending on, on the hospital, but those subsequent uh, antenatal appointments are often around 15 to 20 minutes long. Mm -hmm. um, typically those appointments will follow the same schedule, whether it's a standard model or continuity. And I'll talk about that in a minute. If you're looking at a continu continuity model, those midwives often their appointments will be 20, 30 minutes, or in some circumstances they may be up to an hour in the public system. Mm, okay. As a private midwife, um, my appointments, whether they're antenatal, postnatal, lap patient, they're all an hour. Mm. So I I cost more because I spend more time, but I find that that, that spending time enables everyone to be on the same page when we come to the, yeah. the point of the, the birth and the parenting. It's time well spent. Yeah. And just to finish on the, the uh, mm. schedule, so if you're pregnant and having a baby, you often will have around about seven to ten antenatal appointments in your pregnancy. Um, and that would include a, a GP appointment maybe to confirm that you're pregnant. That could be with a midwife. It doesn't always need to be with a GP. And then you'd probably have another appointment before your 20 weeks and then you'd have an appointment at 20 weeks. Then they're monthly up until you're probably 32 weeks and then fortnightly. And if you're a first-time mother, you might have a few more appointments. You might have weekly appointments towards the end of your pregnancy. Mm. Interesting. Now, how many women does a continuity midwife take on per month? Okay. So this is a bit of a hot topic at the moment mm. uh, because hospitals are busy places and they're wanting to fit more into less time. Um, and um, But the all the, I suppose, all of the models that have been going since the 19, late 1980s, early 1990s have been based on a midwife caring for four women per month when you take into consideration her annual leave. So a midwife in a hospital system will often have about six weeks annual leave a year, um, and which is two more than two more weeks than the average person. But that takes into consideration their anti, their non-social hours, so their their night duty, their weekend work. Mm -hmm. um, so if you look at that, it works out at around about thirty six women a year. Right. Yeah. And what would the average say obstetrician? How many women would they have per month? Okay. Um, this is very individualised. Mm -hmm. So some obstetricians will, because obstetricians are often obstetricians and gynaecologists, mm -hmm. so they'll have a, an obstetric workload, which is caring for women in pregnancy, yeah. and then they'll have a gynaecology workload, which is offering women treatment and surgery for women's business, gyne, gyne stuff. And so if the obstetrician is um, mostly focused on the obstetric work, then they may book between 5 and 20 or 30 women a month. Right. Yeah. That's probably um, a good question to ask, wouldn't it be? It is a good question. And, and the notion, if you've got a continuity midwife, there's an expectation she's going to be there for your labour and birth unless she's not working that day and then one of her colleagues who hopefully you know will care for you so the notion is on average women's labor if you sort of pull it out between a first time and a second time or third time labor we calculate that care being on about eight hours of care right so you will have a midwife who who will care for you in labor so if you're a first-time mother, it might be between 12 and 24 hours that you're having labour care. So you'd probably go through a couple of midwives in that time. But if you're a second-time mother, you know your labour might be between 4 and 12 hours. So we calculate it on about 8 hours. If you're an obstetrician, 
<clears throat> you tend to hop in and out. You're not there constantly. Um, and for you, if you're there for the for the vaginal birth, that care for you would probably involve around about an hour of work. Right. Or if you have a booked cesarean, then you're probably looking at about, depending how quick they are with their surgery, between 45 minutes and two hours for the surgery. Right. Yeah. Mm. So it's very much, you know, the, the birth, the birth work for those obstetricians and midwives is very different in regards to load. Yeah, that's lovely. Mm. Thank you. I think that uh, for those listening, I think that can just really help you to be clear in the expectations of what the different models of care can look at, look like, what sort mm. of um, how much contact you actually have with these people. But at the end of the day, it's where you feel safe, okay? We're fortunate Absolutely. that we have, yeah, we're fortunate. We have options. We have, we have choices. Options. Exactly. A lot of places and, don't. And for you, for some women, that safety might mean having a planned caesarean um, in a hospital which offers you um, high-quality um, uh facilities in regards to um, a private hostel, for example, where you know you might have a choice of menu, um, you have your own um, post postnatal room where um, you might be there for five days. Mm. Or it might mean that you're having a home birth um, because for you hospitals are scary places and you don't want to go there. Um, and uh, that midwife will come to your home to care for you for your, for your birth and for then your postnatal care and everything in between. But I always say to people, if you're wanting to feel and have a good experience and a successful physiological experience, safety will enable your hormones to do what they need to do. Mm. If you're scared and frightened, then you've got the hormones, the stress hormones overlaying the oxytocin and so often your labour will falter or slow or stop um, or it might mean that you have more bleeding after the birth, which in itself can then become a medical emergency. So you need to feel safe and secure, yeah. whatever your choices are. Mm. Absolutely. And yeah. I, th I think what we can take from this conversation is that there are different options. It's important that right. regardless of what option you choose, that you ask questions, you engage with your carers, you get very clear on what's important to you. And in doing that, a childbirth education course like mine or other, um, I, I'm a great proponent of other childbirth education programs like calm birth or hypnobirthing that look at the mind, the role of the mind when it comes to labour. So those types of programs can really help you get clear on what's important to you to create a one-page birth preferences, birth map, um, as a communication tool and device for your partner to then be able to advocate on your behalf, to know that you can ask questions, which is really important, because then your satisfaction of the th things on the other side uh, definitely increase if you feel you've been a part of that decision-making process. And then, depending on what your options are, creating some type of continuity, both prenatally, during the birth, postnatally, whether it be through your social system that you're a part of, friends, family, um, systems like mine, we're based on continuity of education, support and community. That's what our pillars are for it. We support women not just for the birth and through our Transform Your Birth course, but we also do follow-ups after that. On the other side, we have weekly drop-in sessions on Zoom where we have health professionals talking to you, guiding you, supporting you new mothers groups, new fathers groups, and then we've got the parent membership for people who really want to dive into their parenting. So there's a, there's my sort, my systems and other systems out there worth exploring, but this is a very, very important time in your life. So go for gold, go for gold standard care and look around and see what you have access to. Is there anything you want to finish off with, Ali, to our audience? I've, I've, I've got two pieces of information, if that's okay. Yeah, So. Go. First off, um, when you're choosing um, your model of care in regards to education and information for childbirth um, and parenting, 
have a think about what that education is based on. So if you're getting um, antenatal education from uh, one of the hospitals, um, then often that education is about what they offer, not what will help you to make decisions for your own individual needs. Mm, very true. So that's where um, an external provider such as Tracy um, might be able to provide you information based on what your individual needs are. Mm. Secondly, the ability to make decisions and feel confident confident about um, questioning the information you're being provided will often put the other person, um, uh, it will challenge them. And I think as a health professional, and I've just had an experience yesterday, as a health professional, we need to be challenged. You know, just because we've given you advice doesn't mean that that, that advice is 100% um, correct for you. Yeah. So um, you might be seeking further information or you might be seeking other op options. Mm -hmm. And it's your right as a person who's receiving that care to get all the information that you need to make your choices. Mm. I think decision-making that happens during pregnancy and birth works a whole lot better when people have had this back and forth um, conversation. And if you do get health professionals who find it confronting or, um, the, you know, a challenge to their own professional opinion and they react to that, that's really important information for you when it comes to developing a relationship of trust and an ability to communicate. So yeah. any egos in the room, darling, you may want to think very carefully about continuing to work with that person because I don't think there's any place for ego when it comes to women's safety and not only that but women getting through the birth process being ready to parent if she feels like she's been hit by a Mack truck because she's done things she hasn't wanted to do then that's going to change her parenting experience completely absolutely and mm -hmm. the aim of the game should be supporting families to be strong and confident yeah. And the central person of that family is the person who's given birth to that child. Mm, exactly. Um, it's really important that they have the confidence and the strength to hold that family together mm. and to nurture that, each individual person in that family. Exactly. You're the one yeah. left holding the baby. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Oh, Ali, okay. thank you. I've really appreciated your professional expertise in this area. You've explored very deeply into the models of care and the, and what a powerful influence relationship has on the outcomes of both mothers and, and babies. So yeah. it's, a, it's, a, it's a complex system. Yeah, it the, is. The system doesn't know how to explain itself. No. I hope so, this has um, been helpful in helping yeah. people understand what their options are. So yeah. thanks for listening and we'll see you again next week for another episode of the Transform Your Birth podcast. Take care and have Thank a great day. See you, Bye. everyone. Bye. Thanks, Molly. We hope you enjoyed this episode. Please subscribe and share this podcast. Transform Parenting is a childbirth and parenting education organisation that supports families through pregnancy all the way through the first seven years of parenting. Why not watch our free webinar on Keeping Relaxed and Excited About Birth, where we discuss the three most important things that will change a birth. You'll find us at our website on www.transformparenting.com.au. Thanks for listening.